Uh, right when we left off on Wednesday, we were talking about the three vital functions of the pleural membrane and the pleural cavity filled up with the pleural fluid. We already know that it's a fr uh, friction reducing system. It helps to, to aid in the development of pressure gradients. And then three is it compartmentalizes. Okay, so we have compartmentalization. And I'm <clears throat> illustrating some of the compartments and the compartmentalization that we have in the human body. And this compartmentalization helps to divide up the organs so that we don't have the heart running on the lungs, the lungs running on the liver, the liver running on other tissues. So there are three, what I'm going to refer to as sacs in the thoracic cavity. And those three sacs, we've already identified uh, two of them now. We've identified the pericardium, which is the sac that holds the heart. We've identified the pleural membrane, which I'm just going to put in as pleura, which is plural for plural, which holds the lungs. And then lastly, we also have this compartment called the mediastinum. And this is going to be the compartment or the sac that holds the esophagus, the trachea, blood supply, and nervous supply. Now all of these organs, um, really with the exception of the nerves, but the trachea, the esophagus, and the vessels, and the lungs, and the heart, they're all moving, right? The moving systems, the heart beats, the lungs uh, expanding and contract as they move air in and out, expire and inspire. The esophagus uh, induces peristalsis, which moves food down into the stomach. The trachea opens and closes as we restrict and reduce restrictions on airflow. The vessels are constantly moving as they uh, respond to changes in blood pressure. So if we had just all of this stuff kind of grouped together and been protected in these sacs, we'd have all kinds of friction um, and, and points of contact that would, would be constantly rubbing and would be uh, in a lot of pain all of the time. So we compartmentalize everything, and this helps to prevent the movement of those organs from impacting each other. So prevent the movement of organs from impacting others. So now we're going to really switch gears. We've gone through the anatomy. We've identified some of the basic processes. We now be, need to begin the process of moving air and gases from the external environment into the working tissue and from the working tissue back out to the external environment. And you'll remember that it all starts with breathing or ventilation. Okay, so ventilation, it's going to be the basics of breathing. Now, just like with many of the other physiological phenomena that we've discussed, shouldn't surprise you that this is going to occur in a cycle. OK, 
Okay, so this occurs in a breathing cycle. I'm going to bring that image up here um, so you can sort of see that breathing cycle. We're going to have exhalation, inhalation, and in all reality, we're going to have a third step, which is going to be rest. It's basically uh, a time when we don't have anything going on to help exhalation and inhalation to occur. This is all going to come down to creating pressure gradients by changing volume, and it's going to be facilitated through the work and action of skeletal muscle. So in the breathing cycle, we have inhalation, sometimes referred to as inspiration. Which is going to be moving air into the lungs from the external environment. Then we have exhalation or expiration, which is moving air out of the lungs back into the environment. Now, the process of exhalation and insulation, insulation, inhalation. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully we don't have any insulation that's involved in this process. The process of exhalation and inhalation can vary by forcefulness. We can have very forceful breaths, like maybe blowing out the candles on your birthday cake. Or you can have very quiet, restful breathing like most of you are doing right now. So both inhalation and exhalation can occur on varying levels of force. Now the breathing cycle, when it's just very mellow and we don't have a high rate of breathing, we simply refer to that as quiet respiration. So quiet respiration is normally relaxed and unconscious. Which makes it an autonomic reflex or under autonomic control. You don't have to think about it. Um, until probably this point you weren't really thinking about your breathing, now you're all probably thinking about your breathing. The opposite of quiet respiration is forced respiration. And forced respiration is going to be very deep and typically very rapid. Uh, the most common forced respiration that I can think of is going to be exercise induced. Now, the thing that's very interesting about this is with exercise, most of the time you're not really thinking about breathing. And so it's still somewhat autonomic in, uh, in control. And it's just responding to the change in workload. And really it's responding to the need for oxygen in the working tissue. The more oxygen that's needed, the more respiration that needs to occur within a given unit of time. But in all reality, forced respiration can actually be conscious. And one example I can think of here would be playing a wind instrument. playing a wind instrument where you're controlling the respirations to perform a specific task. <coughs> now, when we get to the point of ventilation and, and discussing the, the physiology of ventilation, in all reality, it's actually a specialized form of physics known as mechanics.
So the physiology of breathing and, and really of ventilation is really better summarized as the mechanics of ventilation. And mechanics is basically a area of physics where you use forces or you can uh, direct forces to accomplish some sort of task. Uh, the engine in a car is a mechanical physical system and we're using chemical reactions to generate force to spin wheels and axles and differentials and things like that. In this case, we're going to use the chemistry and the biology of skeletal muscle as our force, and we are going to modify the size of the chamber, if you will, the thoracic cavity, to change pressures. Okay, so we need to know a little bit about the muscles that are involved. <clears throat> so here is a picture uh, with highlighted muscles illustrating a variety of the muscles that are involved in both inspiration and expiration. Okay, so for expiration, I'm going to divide this up into muscles that are superior, muscles associated with the ribcage, and muscles that are inferior of the thoracic cavity. So superior, these are going to be above the thoracic cavity. Sternocleidomastoid is going to be one of our breathing muscles. And sternocleidomastoid, which you can see here, is attached in part to the sternum. And when you breathe, we have a small amount of sternocleidomastoid activity that leads towards elevation of the sternum. So sternal elevation or sternum elevation. And that contraction of sternocleidomastoid is actually going to pull up and elevate the sternum. It's not, I'm over-exaggerating obviously with my hand here, it's not a giant change, but it is a change that results in an increase in thoracic cavity volume. By the way, what's going to happen with thoracic cavity pressure? It can decrease. Keep that pressure volume relationship in mind. It's inverse, inversely related. We have a second superior muscle, and these will be the scalenes. And these are, you can see, these are going to be lateral of sternocleidomastoid. And they are not going to be associated with the sternum, but rather ribs one and two. And so when the scalenes contract, we have elevation, elevation of ribs one and two. Okay, so this is basically dealing with this upper portion of the thoracic cavity picking that up and moving it out. Now, in all reality, the muscles that are very much involved in increasing thoracic pressure or thoracic volume are going to be our rib and our inferior muscles. The muscles associated with the rib cage for expiration, we're going to have three muscles of importance. The external intercostals, which by the way, the intercostal just simply refers to the fact that these muscles sit between the ribs. <coughs> these are going to be the most external of the muscles. So these are going to be along the surface. They also are sometimes, as in this figure here, referred to the expiratory intercostals. And when these contract, the external inter intercostals will have an effect of widening the rib cage. Pectoralis minor, which or which um, attaches to some of our ribs will also be involved in some degree here. 
to elevate ribs three through five. And then finally, we're going to have our internal intercostals, which really are not going to contract in any real way to cause elevation of the ribs, but rather will provide support as the <coughs> external intercostals, my expiratory intercostals, contract to cause uh, opening up of the, of the rib cage. Okay, so those internal intercostals are going to be supporters and help to facilitate that rib elevation process. Now, the description that is frequently given for elevation of the ribs is, this is a bucket, if you can't tell. So the bucket has a handle on it, and when the rib muscles contract, it's like pulling up on that handle of that bucket so it reflects upward. So the ribs kind of move up and out as if you were to pull on the handle of a bucket. Right, now our inferior muscle, there's just one, and this is a, ends up being a very important muscle. This is going to do a lot of, uh, of the change in thoracic cavity volume, and that's going to be this weird muscle called the diaphragm. So the diaphragm, and you can see that represented here sort of in this purplish bluish color. The diaphragm is going to sit up kind of at the base of the ribs. So if you kind of feel where the bottom of your ribs are, this is right where the diaphragm is going to be associated. Now, when the rib or uh, when the diaphragm is uh, relaxed, it actually has sort of this dome shape up into the rib cage and reduces the volume by pushing up on the bottom. But the diaphragm is actually going to be attached to the lungs or attached to the pleural membrane. And when it contracts, it pulls down and it flattens out of uh, out of that rib cage to descend down towards the lower ribs. And so by pulling on the bottom of the lungs, there is very large change in volume there, which results in a very large decrease in pressure. Okay, so that is all muscles involved in expiration. Now, how about inspiration? You know what? I got these two switched on you. I'm, I'm saying expiration, and I really should be saying inspiration. On that first yeah, because where inspiration is bringing air in. Yeah. I just have the, the, what I did is I have one inspiration, two inspiration. So just go back in your notes. Yeah, one should be inspiration. And so this will be expiration. Yeah, to inspire is to bring air in. That means we have to the volume and drop, to drop pressure. I apologize for that. Let me sure I get that changed. Okay, so expiration. Interco the internal intercostals, they were supporting the 
uh, outward movement of the ribs. In this case, they're actually going to be involved when, when they are signaled to contract, they will depress the ribs. So they, they, they basically, that's supposed to be a B, not a P. They basically are going to oppose the external intercostals. Those bring the ribs out. These are the antagonists. We'll bring the ribs back into their original position. The diaphragm will just simply relax. And when the diaphragm relaxes, it relaxes back into the thoracic cavity. We're also going to involve, and that's what you can see down here in yellow, a couple abdominal muscles, in particular rectus abdominis. rectus abdominis and our oblique muscles. These will also, these are attached in our ribs to the lower ribs and will depress and help to return those ribs to their original position. Okay, so all of these muscles are involved in increasing thoracic volume or to returning thoracic volume back to a resting state. This results in changes in volume, and again, every time we have a change in volume, we got to think about what's happening with pressure. So the mechanics eventually leads to fluid dynamics. So mechanically, we're using the muscles to change volume, which invariably affects the fluid dynamics or the pressure of the respiratory system. Now, we've dealt just a little bit with pressure in the past. Yeah, Meredith, you want to move on? Yeah. Just a quick question. When, like, people tell me to breathe in my nose and out of my mouth, like when I'm tired or something, I'm icy with it, like, why do they... Rather than like breathing in and out, like, yeah. Well, that really mean it doesn't really mean anything. When you're exercising, this is my recommendation breathe whatever way you want to to accomplish the task of moving enough oxygen to support your muscles. In all reality, I mean, it's kind of like you know, the old adage there's a lot of things that. And I'm not talking about any specific coaches, not coaches here at True. <laughs> but every year there, on the football field, we have kids who get really seriously hurt or even die because the coach is like, you don't drink any water during practice. And that goes back 50 years ago when there was some fangled idea that if you consume water, it'll cause cramping or something like that. And it's not even physiologically true. This is another example of something, some myth that is sort of pervaded that if for some reason you breathe through your nose and breathe out your mouth, it's going to reduce the, the, the chance of, a, of cramping, muscle cramping. No, it's not going to. Breathe any way you want to accomplish the task. We used to bring guys in and uh, we'd, we'd run them all the way up to their maximal amount of exertion and it didn't matter. There was air was coming in and out of everything they could move it in and out of. <laughs> All right. So physics of pressure. We dealt a little bit with this with the circulatory system. Uh, we're going to deal with it a little bit more here. Just kind of a, a, a sort of introduction uh, to physics before we really begin to apply this to the physiological, biological system. So you've already remembered and relayed to me that volume and pressure have an inverse relationship.
And that inverse relationship just simply means that if we have an increase in volume, we have a decrease in pressure. And you're seeing uh, the effects of the opposite here in both of these figures. You're basically seeing if we push on the syringe, we'll have a decrease in volume. And that decrease in volume results in a higher pressure here. So we're creating more pressure as we depress that syringe. So pressure increases. Now, just to make sure we kind of get this concept, what if I were to cover up that hole right there? And I pressed on that syringe, what would happen? We're going to build the pressure up, and if that seal is good enough, eventually I'm not going to be able to push anymore because the pressure is going to be so great that it's going to exceed my muscle capacity or my ability to apply uh, enough force. Okay, so... When we're talking about volume and pressure, volume and pressure, again, are acting upon something. They're acting upon a fluid. So in, this, in these two examples here, you have a volume in the syringe and a pressure in that syringe. And they're acting upon a fluid. I mean, it, it looks like they're showing that there's a fluid coming out, like water or something like that. But it could also just be a gas. So the fluid could be air, or I could even put that as gas or liquid. Both of these types of matter, gas and liquid, are fluids, and they are going to fill a space. Now, it's that space that is the volume. And so this is where I kind of want you to understand this. I guess I, I think I'm reiterating this because I think we've already talked about this, that if I have a container, that container, if it's a beaker or something like that, it's going to have a total volume. You know, I could put a cover on it here, and then we could say, okay, that is a 1,000 milliliter or 1 liter volume. And then I could fill it up with a little bit of water, And that water is also going to have a volume, but it's not the same volume, and it's not the volume we're talking about when we're talking about change in volume, change in pressure. So the fluid, even though we can measure it as a volume, we need to keep it separate in our minds from the volume that we're actually talking about. Does that make sense? So in your lungs, your lungs have a certain volume. And that certain volume can be filled up with air. But just because we have the certain volume doesn't mean that we're going to have that amount of air in our lungs. Just like this, is it half empty or half full? When we change volume, we invariably affect pressure, and then that pressure acts upon the fluid. So pressure we can define as a force that acts on the fluid. So pressure is the force acting on the fluid. Now, because it is a force, that's a type of mechanical work, and that means that that pressure can cause movement. So by changing the pressure, ignoring volume, if we just change pressure, we're going to cause a change in the fluid's movement capabilities or pattern. Now, as we change these pressure characteristics, we have to note that fluids are always going to travel from areas of elevated pressure two areas of decreased pressure. And you've all experienced this effect before, even in, in the environment around you. Whenever we have wind, we have a high pressure area and a low pressure area that is causing <laughs> air to move 
from high pressure to low pressure, the effects of that is wind. Now when you're breathing, we change volume, change pressure because of that change in volume, and create a pressure gradient between the lungs and the external environment. Does everybody have all of this? So can anyone give me another name that might be a reasonable description of what I've just described there, where we go from places of high pressure to low pressure? Pressure gradient. And again, we can have a pressure gradient that is liquid-based, or we can have a pressure gradient that is gas-based. We are going to be talking about gas-based pressure gradients. But if I wanted to move, let's say I spilled a whole bunch of water here in the room and I wanted to move it from here outside, I could increase the pressure here and have lower pressure outside and the water would flow outside. Or if I wanted to put it in the ceiling, I don't know why I'd want to do that. I could increase the pressure here, have lower pressure there, and I'd move it up into the ceiling. So, when you're thinking about this, the pressure out here, it's not changing, right? Occasionally it does, and then we see that as, a, as, a, as wind. But the change in pressure to create wind is very, very minute. You'll recognize that we measure pressure in the external environment as a barometric pressure, and we have barometers. And we basically, in the environment, fluctuate from about 28 up to about 32, and that's probably even a wide range of pressures. The lungs are going to have to change enough that we go on either side of that pressure gradient to cause airflow in and out of the lungs. If I want to bring air into the lungs, I have to be well below that external environment pressure. If I want to bring air back out of the lungs, I've got to be well above. So the reason that it's harder to breathe at higher elevations is because the pressure is so much lower. It's also related to, even though the percentage of the gases that are present in the air doesn't change, the quantity of those gases significantly decreases. Because as pressure, really the reason that we have pressure in our environment is because we live underneath this gigantic atmosphere. And as you move closer and closer to the center of the earth, you have more and more gravity. And so this column of pressure is basically affected by that gravitational pull where those molecules of oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, helium, water vapor are being pulled towards the center of the earth. And it just happens there's enough of it collected here where we live that we can actually survive because there's enough oxygen. But as we go up, if I were to kind of draw, so here's the earth's surface. Cleveland, Georgia is right here, which is right around 2,000 feet. Up here where the planes fly, 35,000 feet. If I just kind of draw in a representation of these molecules, I'm going to keep on getting more and more molecules until I have many, many more molecules down here than I do up here at 35,000 feet. Lower pressure here, higher pressure here, just because of the raw quantity of molecules that are present. Well, but in swimming, we're adding in water. And now you have water that's pressing down on you, and that's creating a pressure as well. Um, and uh, if I were to bring in one meter by one meter by one meter, that is a metric ton. So take that meter, I mean, and sit underneath it, and then add more of them, and you go down 20 meters, you know, have 20 metric tons sitting above you, go down 100 meters, 100 metric tons pressing in on you. Pretty soon you get, you get to a point where that pressure is so, so heavy that it begins to press on your lungs, your tissue, begins to push air out 
rather than allowing it to come in from your scuba equipment. <laughs> Okay, so our pressure gradient, we're going to use our lungs to fluctuate above and below the standard pressure, the unchanging for all intents and purposes uh, of respiration, the unchanging pressure in the environment. Okay, so let's actually break this down and talk just a little bit about how we actually are going to do this. Okay, so an extension of the breathing cycle is going to be the respiratory cycle. And we can take a look at the respiratory cycle here in this figure. There's also going to be figures in your book. And you'll notice that there are three different phases. And here's our illustration of the bucket example that I gave, pulling that, lifting that bucket handle up and letting it back down to cross changes and ribs. So three different phases. Phase number one is going to be the relaxed state. So everything that we're going to talk about here with the respiratory cycle is basically what is happening in the lungs or the thoracic cavity to move it above and below the environmental pressure to alter our pressure gradient to allow air to come in and air to go out. So phase one is going to be our relaxed state. And during the relaxed state, we call it relaxed because really there's no airflow. By the way, kind of think ahead a little bit. If there's no airflow, what does that mean in terms of pressure in the lungs versus pressure here in the environment? They are equal. They're the same. They are equalized. So during the relaxed state, we're going to have the diaphragm relaxed, which means that it is dome shaped into the cavity, into the thoracic cavity. The intercostal muscles are relaxed. And that means they're pressing down or they're situated in a um, downward position on the ribs, pressing down on the, uh, on the thoracic cavity, rather. And so the pressure in the lungs, once we reach this relaxed state, is going to be equal to the pressure in the environment. So pressure in the lungs is equal to the pressure in the environment. And this means no pressure gradient exists, no gradient, and results in no movement of air. So no airflow. Now as we begin to need to take a breath, we're going to move into phase two. This will basically be now the breathing cycle. Phase two is going to be inhalation. Also could be referred to as inspiration. Now, you should already basically have a really good idea of what needs to happen here. Inspiration means what? What does that mean? Breathing air in. What needs to happen? What kind of pressure gradient do I need to create? So a high pressure or higher pressure outside, <coughs> lower pressure in the lungs. How do I create lower pressure in the lungs? I'm going to increase volume. And how am I going to mechanically increase volume? Okay, and I'm going to cause the intercostals to pull the ribs out. I'm going to cause the diaphragm to dip away. The scalenes and the sternocleidal mastoid are going to pull up on the upper portion of the rib cage. And we're just simply going to increase volume. Okay, so muscles contract, and this causes the ribs to move out, and the diaphragm causes the bottom of the thoracic cavity. To 
flatten, moving out of that dome shape. And so thoracic cavity and lung volume are going to increase, and that means that the pressure in the container, being the lungs, going to decrease. So decreased pressure in lungs. Now, if I were to sort of draw this out, the bottom of the cavity, it flattens. I guess I'm getting a little bit quick here. I thought you knew this. So the bottom of the cavity is going to flatten. The ribs are going to move out. That expands the thoracic cavity. And then by way of the pleural membrane, which is attached to the thoracic cavity, pulls on the lungs. The lungs expand out, alveoli get a little bit bigger, create a very low pressure environment. So if I were to sort of draw this out, and hopefully you can sort of see that, if that's my environmental pressure, it's not really changing. This, by the way, frequently will measure in millimeters of mercury. And it's right around 760 millimeters of mercury, plus or minus a couple of millimeters of mercury. Environmental pressure. Pressure in the room right now. If we were to bring a column of mercury in here, we measure it at 760. So during the relaxed state, it's going to line right up on top of that uh, of that pressure, 760. Now we're trying to move air into the lungs. And that means that we have to drop the pressure. So we increase volume, which causes a decrease in pressure. And now from this point to this point, that's the concentration gradient that we just created. Now, as air begins to flow into the lungs, we're adding additional fluid into the lungs, additional gas into the lungs, and we're going to begin to slowly go back up because we're reducing the volume we're, we're you know putting more fluid and gas into that volume causing that volume to decrease causing the pressure to increase so you take in a deep breath and eventually it stops right you eventually have a reduction in airflow as we get back up and equalize that pressure <laughs> So all of this, the pressure drops, we get a pressure between the environment and the lungs, where the lungs have a lower pressure than the environment, which is our pressure gradient. <laughs> okay, so that's supposed to be gradient. And that pressure gradient, we're going to have airflow into the lungs, which will slowly, so we create the pressure gradient, and then we fill the pressure gradient up. And expiration, I'm sorry, inspiration, moving air in, slowly decreases until we equalize again, because we filled up all of the air in that space. And effectively, we're reducing the volume, which increases the pressure back to 760 millimeters of mercury. Now that you got full lungs, we'll pick up with phase three exhalation on Monday.